Praise God. Praise God. You know, we've just concluded all of the events of what we call Holy Week or Passion Week, Good Friday services, Resurrection Sunday services. And there are several accounts recorded of the encounters of the disciples with the resurrected Jesus. And at some point, the disciples went back to Galilee, where Peter declared he was going fishing. And six of the others that are named in there are decided to join him. And you know the story. They fished all night, didn't catch anything. And as they're returning to the shore in the early dawn light, Jesus is standing on the shore and calling to them to ask him if they'd caught anything. And when they told him they had not, remember what he said, cast your net on the right side of the boat. I like to think it's not only the right side, it's the right side. Right? Cast your net on the right side of the boat. Now why, this is what I'm thinking, why would a bunch of tired, cold, hungry, discouraged fishermen who were coming to shore after, I mean, they were finished with their fishing. They were done. They'd caught nothing. They'd had it. They're coming to shore. Why would they suddenly obey someone calling out to them from the shore? I'll throw you that one more time. They weren't in the fishing waters. They were up by shore. They weren't out in the deep. They were coming in into the shore now. This wasn't the place for fishing. But there must have been some sort of an authoritative command in that voice that caused them to go ahead and throw out that net. Of course, you know the story. They caught a huge catch of fish. That, uh, they, uh, and uh, as soon as they did, of course, the one recorded as John, who wrote this, John 21, he says, uh, that's Jesus. That's the Lord. Yeah. And uh, Peter immediately jumps into the water and starts for shore and uh, leaves the rest of them out there struggling with the net. And uh, as, uh, as they come to shore, uh, Jesus, I like, Jesus says, well, help them pull in the net. You know? yeah. So he turns around and he helps them pull it to shore. And they come in and he says they've got a huge catch of fish. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of stories that can be brought out from this account here. Uh, you know, why did they go fishing? Uh, you can talk about the miraculous catch and what that would probably mean. We can talk about the net didn't break. Okay, that, that's a, you know, here they had a huge catch. The net didn't break. Uh, talk about Peter swimming to shore ahead of all the rest. But I want to focus on what happened around the fire. And I want to turn to John chapter 21. And because uh, they find that Jesus is on shore here. And he has a, a breakfast of fish and bread here waiting for them. Okay. John chapter 21, we're going to pick it up after all of this, after Peter went up and dragged the net to shore, and they're looking at this. Verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, Lord, knowing that it was the Lord. <laughs> Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. Now this is, how, this is now the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, tend my sheep. Then he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I want us to look at what's taking place here around the, around the fire. Having warmed and dried themselves and satisfied their hunger, Jesus begins a conversation. 
he addresses Peter as Simon, son of Jonah, not by the name that he had given him, Cephas, the rock, or Peter. He didn't, you know, this is what he said, I'm going to call you Peter. He didn't address him as what he was calling him during his time of ministry, but the name that he used when he first called Peter to follow him three and a half years ago. And he's calling him back to thinking about who he is, who he was, and who he should be at this time. Okay, now you think, Simon, son of John, why are you calling me that? Okay, thinking about who he is, who he should be. Peter, where are you in your thinking right now? What is your identity in your relationship to me at this time? And although Peter had been meeting with the rest of the disciples, we can be sure he was still carrying around the weight of his denial of Jesus. And in the other appearances of Jesus, there had been no mention made to Peter about this denial. And so we read in the account, of course, when this happened, the reality of what hit him the conviction was so strong, it says he went out and he wept bitterly. But now he was probably sitting there in an awkward silence by the fire, wondering if Jesus would address what he had done. And Jesus asks him, Simon, or yes, yeah, son of Jonah, where did I just lost it here, son of Jonah, he says, Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? He didn't ask, did you weep more? Right. Which, think back to the woman who washed the feet of Jesus with her tears. What did Jesus say? He said, he referred to her who was one who has forgiven much, so she loved much. And he's asking Peter if he realize, if he's realizing how much he has been forgiven and does his love for Jesus correspond to the depth of that forgiveness. But there's another dimension to that question as Jesus asks him if he loves him more than these others do. Do you love me more than these do? Add the do on the end of this here, right? As they were all leaving the upper room, remember the night they were all leaving the upper room, Jesus all of them would desert him before the night was over. Peter stands up, boldly proclaimed, even if all of the others desert you, I will not leave you, even if I have to die for you. Within hours, he's denying he knows Jesus. Peter boasted in front of all the other men, now in the presence of these men, could he humble himself in front of them to take away the doubt of the sincerity of his love? Now Jesus is reminding Peter that even though he was implying that he loved Jesus more than the others did, does he really now mean that he loves Jesus more than these do? The reference here had to cut Peter right to the heart. And then... He's also asking him, do you love me more than you love all of these? There's another part of that question. You've traveled with these men for three years plus. You've become close friends as you have worked together in this ministry. Are you comfortable to be working with them or, or let, let me say it this way. Let me, let me add something here. One of them is your brother. Two of them are your cousins. And they've been your business partners before you came to follow uh, this ministry. He said, would you be willing to leave them all behind and follow what I call you to do? You know, there's a familiarity when you're working in the crowd and working with one another. knowing. But what if Jesus calls you out to walk a different path? He says, do you love me more than you love these? Yeah. Are you willing to leave them all behind and follow what I call you to do? Peter, do you love me? 
Now, the word he uses here for love is the type of love that God would express toward man. It's the unconditional love not based upon merit. It's not earned by action or attitude of the recipient. It's not out of affection or emotional response, but rather an exercise of the will or a deliberate choice. It suggests a love that values and esteems. It's an unselfish love that is ready to serve. He says, are you willing to love me as a choice? A choice you make based on a direct act of your will because of who I am. Now Peter, maybe out of hesitancy of understanding his own feelings or uh, not being sure just where the question was leading, he replies with words that show tender affection. The word he used, according to the Vines book, it says, conveys the thought of cherishing the object above all else, of manifesting an affection characterized by constancy, constancy from the motive of the highest veneration. So it is a good word. It's just not the same word Jesus used. Okay? But Jesus answers him then. He says, feed my lambs. Why lambs? These would be the, the newly born into the kingdom. These would be the young converts, the, the precious ones just starting out in their, their newfound life of faith. And, and Jesus is, is saying he could not entrust these precious young converts into the hands of someone who does not have a deep and abiding love for him and would in turn then love these little ones. He said, do you love me? He said, because you've got to love them as you love me. That's what he's, he's trying to point out here. Do you love me? Well, then take care of my little lambs here. But then Jesus asks him again, Peter, do you love me? Peter answered, you know I love you. He, he's saying, you know my heart. You know of my love for you. And to this, Jesus says, tend my sheep. Now that word tend is to mean to tend like a shepherd, to feed, to nurture, to care for, to protect, to watch over my flock as I would. Well, you know, Peter denied Jesus three times. And that had to be burning within him as Peter asked him, or Jesus asked Peter that third time, do you love me? He's asking Peter three times to affirm his love and devotion that he had three times denied in his self-seeking desire to save himself from any harm that might come to him for having allegiance to Jesus. So he's basically saying, where's your allegiance now? Do you love me? And out of his deep grief over his repeated failure, Peter states, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. He's saying, even though I failed you and I've doubted myself, I know that you know deep down inside of me there's a true love and devotion that I have for you. Basically what he's doing, he's calling upon Jesus to witness to his love for him. Jesus, you be a witness of my love. Jesus replied, feed my sheep. The shepherd is to care for the whole flock. He's to be tenderly nurturing the newborn lambs and caring for and feeding the mature sheep as well. And the flock, remember, is the most treasured possession of Jesus. He died for them. And he will only entrust them into the care of a shepherd who will love them in the way that he loves them. Someone who will also lay down his life for the sheep out of his deep devotion for the good shepherd. Yeah. Now in this discourse, Jesus restored the repentant and forgiven Peter into his apostleship. Okay? In this, Jesus showed his confidence that Peter would be faithfully discharging the responsibilities of his office in the leading and caring of his flock. Okay? Now, we all have differing callings from the Lord. 
Okay, differing ways that God works in our lives. We've all we've come from many varied backgrounds, uh, complete with different traditions, uh, different cultural surroundings. We all have a past, but praise God, we're the redeemed. Amen. We're the children of God. We're led by His Spirit. We are anointed in different ways to be ministering to His flock. Think about this. I mean, that goes not only for the five-fold ministry that offices that we're talking about here, but every believer is called to minister the gospel to all people. Okay? When, when Jesus gave the Great Commission, He says, Now, just, just you who are called to the five-fold ministry, go out and minister. He says, Everyone who wants to be a disciple of the Lord. Now, everybody who's following Jesus has the responsibility to tell about Jesus. Okay? We're all disciples. We all have the, the responsibility to carry that gospel message uh, to everyone. But we all have different callings on our life, different ways of doing it, because we all have different personalities. Remember what we said before, you know, uh, oneness is not sameness. Okay, unity in the Spirit is not uniformity. Okay, we all have different personalities, different talents, different giftings, different abilities, different callings, and different anointings. We all do things differently based on how God works in our lives, Amen. not trying to copy what someone else is doing. Oh, that works good. That looks like fun. I'm going to do what he's doing. doesn't work that way. Okay, we have to do how God is working in our lives. Okay? And just because we are in oneness, we have the same goal, we have the same passion, we have the same vision, but that doesn't make us same. We do it in our differing ways. Unity in the Spirit. We are in unity. We, for instance, I love the unity that when, when, especially when we come into a prayer meeting, there's just a, a unity that begins to flow, and, and we all begin to, to flow in the same things, different people saying different things, but it all fits together into a unity in the Spirit. But we're not unified in, 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 in a way that we are all the same. God's working in us differently. Okay? So I have to ask... Where are we in our walk with God at this time? Now, maybe we've come to a place of great maturity in our Christian life, greatly involved in the work of the ministry, successful in the calling that God has placed upon us. But if Scripture is meant to lead us all to greater revelation of our relationship with God and to strengthen our devotion then Scripture is also questioning us about our current position and, and uh, our position and condition. Yeah. That's right. yeah. And I doubt that any of us here have come to the extreme place of denying that we're followers of Jesus or have known Him personally as Peter had done. Yeah. Okay. But there may have been times when we were operating out of the position of incognito Christian. Yeah, I don't want to look too Christian right here right now. What will they think? Or how will they act? Or how will they accept me? A time now and then when we feel we do not really want to be identified as a believer in Jesus. Hmm. Now, might there be a time when our self-seeking desire allows us to operate in an attitude that does not reflect the love of Jesus for those we're dealing with at that time. There might be times when we're not using our words to deny our faith in Jesus, but our actions are speaking volumes that display a less than Christ-like way of dealing with the current situation. Do we hear the haunting question echoing in the recesses of our spirit, do you love me? Is there a gentle nudge that's trying to move us to a place of repentance? Are we being called back into a place of reconciliation with our Master? Are we being reminded of our need to return to that place of intimate relationship with our Savior? 
are we being called to recognize what it is that caused us to be in the position where we find ourselves at this moment? Where might we have opened a door that has let in an indifference to the cares and the needs of those around us? Have we allowed the pressures of our own circumstances to cause us to be insensitive to what's happening to the flock around us? Jesus asks us, do you love me more than these? More than the comforts of life? Well, I've worked hard and I deserve to do what I want to do, even if I have to turn a deaf ear to the needs of others from time to time. Do you love me more than the things and the activities that are causing the distractions from the responsibilities of working in God's call on your life? There's a lot of distractions. Do you love me more than these, the people who ha you have grown to be comfortable with and lean on to do what you want them to do for you? Do you love me enough to step out of that comfort place and do what I call you to do that's outside of the box you have built for ministry? Now maybe you've made your boast about how much you love the Lord. How you will always be faithful to do what He calls you to do, even when everyone around you quits or fails. And now you find that you've put off doing what the Lord asked you to do or ignored the leading of the Holy Spirit into an uncomfortable condition in your ministry. You know, we've not had to face a lot of persecution in this country yet as Christians, but it's, you see it coming. You see the hostility that, that's rising up against anything Christian, anything to do with God, especially the name of Jesus. I mean, it, it's coming to an open hostility uh, through government channels, through social channels, media channels, every, everywhere you look, uh, it, it's putting down, uh, making of no effect or account or actual hostility against anything that tries to bring the Word of God, the power of, of the, the like, what can I say, the value of the, uh, the moral standard of the Word of God into, into, into society. Okay? Now, like say, we've not faced the persecution that, that some of our, the people we know have felt. I mean, in India alone, uh, the people that we know personally, okay, they're, they're facing a persecution there that, that I mean, people come in and, and beat up the pastors. They, they beat up the people in the churches. They steal their stuff, uh, burn down the churches. They've even killed some of the pastors we've known. Uh, do you want to be known as a Christian in a community that's violent against what you stand for? When they have a baptism service, this is awesome. We, we took part in some of these where, especially at the convention, several people come you know, to the annual convention from all over the, uh, the country, and they go from the convention grounds out to this pond where they baptize. And, uh, but they're all dressed in white. They're all marching in line, and all of the church people are around, and they've got a pickup truck with big old speakers on it, uh, blaring out Christian music. And this procession goes all the way down the road, a couple of miles down the road, down to where they're going to do the baptism service. And they just continue right on out there, blasting out this music, preaching the Word, and they're baptizing the people right here where other people are, are, are watering their, their buffalo or washing their laundry on the rocks or, do, or all the other things that's going on around them. They're right there in the middle of all of this getting baptized. Now, what are they saying? We've become believers in Jesus in a society that's, that's opposed to believers. We're, we're here in a, in a place that is uh, hostile to our faith, and yet we're declaring our faith in Jesus. That may mean that as the people watch them go through town, they won't allow them to shop in their market anymore. Now, I'm not talking about stores like we have. I'm talking about city markets where they bring their wares out and put them on a blanket or on a stand, and you come and buy what you need and say, hey, you, you can't buy my stuff. You're a Christian. But I need food for my family. That's I'm sorry, but you became a Christian. This is for our Hindu people. 
Christians can't drink from a government well. Only Hindus can. Some of them get ostracized by their very families. You can't come back home. You can't come back home. Some were told, that if you come home, I'll kill you. Their own fathers saying to their children, you can't come back home. The government says, I shouldn't go into that. Uh, but anyway, the prevailing thought in the is, is if you're Indian, you're Hindu. And uh, they, 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 they've gone into some of the churches and tried to pay people to renounce Christianity and come back to their mother religion of Hinduism. Okay, now that's persecution. We, and we know of others. We've talked to others in other lands where it's even more dangerous to be a Christian than it is there. See, our, our persecution here is mild. It's just mostly name-calling, and, and uh, although in, in a very nearby country, a pastor has been uh, arrested several times just for standing up for the Word of God against what the government has said. There's a, a very near nation that uh, if those in this country are sending broadcasts into that country on TV and radio, they have to modify them so that they fit their standards or they won't let them preach the gospel there. There have been instances in our own country where mayors in certain cities have, have demanded that preachers turn in a copy of their messages before Sunday morning so that they can go through and make sure there's nothing offensive in their messages. And there's not speaking the truth, right? Now that was quickly squashed, but uh, they were trying. They were trying. Now, like I say, we're, we're not at an extreme case yet. But you can hear, unless something changes, unless uh, revival starts breaking out in such a degree that the people of God rise up and have a voice that says, we're not going to stand for this anymore. We want the standard of the righteousness of our God to prevail. You know, we're going to see things just continue to get worse toward Christians. Now, what happens when they come to you and say, well, are you a believer? Will you hear that sound of that question echoing in the recesses of your spirit when Jesus asks, do you love me? Do you love me? Or is it more convenient to not be identified as a Christian right now? I mean, these are... I'm glad we're not having to face that reality right now yet. But... We're close. We're close. And, uh, and there are places in, in society. I, mean, uh, I was just thinking of uh, an account I just read of somebody on the street. They were just, because they were talking about Jesus, a mob attacked them. So, uh, uh, Jesus is saying, do you love me? Do you love me? Where, where, do, you, where do you stand? Now, I, I don't want this to sound harsh or condemning. That's not what this is about. But I just believe we need to be checking to see if Jesus might be asking us some questions. Yeah. And I believe we always are needing to be examining ourselves to see where we are in carrying out the responsibilities of our calling. Yeah. We're always needing to be examining our devotion to our relationship with the Lord. Yeah. Is asking questions, then we need to figure out how we're going to answer. A true response, right, if, of, yes, Lord, I love you, is also an urgent call to self-examination. Am I answering truly, or am I giving the answer I believe is the expected answer? Peter got down to the the vulnerable place when he said, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, you better know what your level of understanding of yourself is and of your condition is if you're going to call Jesus to witness to your level of love. Okay? Because he does see you, your condition as it really is. So by saying, Lord, you already know that I love you, it's just like Peter calling on Jesus to testify of the depth of your love for him. Okay. Now, 
you have to remember also here, the Lord does not question you to disqualify you from His service. Okay? He wasn't disqualifying Peter. He was restoring Peter. Okay? When we're being asked those questions, it's not to say you're not good enough to do what I've called you to do or you're not in a condition here to be doing what I've called you to do. It's a, always his, his purposes are always redeeming in, in what He's doing. Always an encouragement, always restoring. So if, if you sense Jesus is asking you as you're self-examining in all this, do you love me? It's not that He's saying you don't love me enough. He's saying, do you love me? In other words, are you evaluating where you are right now so you can put things together the way they need to be in your life so that you can uh, do what I've called you to do? He's trying to qualify, it's not disqualify. He's trying to encourage, not discourage. Always building up. Always putting in. Okay, do you love me? Well, let me show you how to love as I love you. Yeah, he's always trying to put us in that place of being ready to serve. He questions you to remind you to be in proper condition for His service. You know, He asks, do you love me? Are there distractions and hindrances that we need to cast down? Are there strongholds of the mind that have clouded your judgment on how you're to be moving with His leading? You know, we can get ideas based on things we've heard, seen, or things that are going on in our life. There's a lot of distractions in life, a lot of things that can pull us one way or another. And do you know uh, what we might look at as responsibilities cloud our judgment on how to weigh them against the responsibilities that God has given us to what He's placed before us to do. Now we encourage family, family activities, family things. God's a family God. He invented family. All right? And so He wants us to be family oriented, family doing things. But you know that we have to also have a balance in what family does. We can be running in every direction, not even have time for the family we're trying to serve. We have to have balance. But then there's a family, a community family of, of believers. We're a family the family of God. And we have to look at what are the things that we might allow ourselves to be pressured or by ourselves. I'm not talking about pressured by other people. I'm talking about the pressures we put on ourselves to do the things for ministry, for church family that are taking us out of balance. We can get out of balance in ministry. We can get out of balance. doing what I think I should do instead of what God is asking me to do. Doing a good thing instead of the God thing. Balance. Balance. So can we allow hindrances and distractions to get us out of balance, or do we have to cast down some of the distractions? Are there strongholds in the mind, I want to say that again, that have clouded our judgment of how we're to be moving with this leading? Because you know, over the past few months, the word that God has given to us is rise up. Rise up. And we've, you know, that word can mean a lot of things to us depending on where we are. It can mean different things to us depending on where we are. Are we rising up to something, or do we have to rise up from something? Do we have to rise up from a place that we have been lulled into a complacency? Maybe not only about our faith, but maybe about our whole attitude toward others, or our, our, our family responsibilities, or the calling that God's placed on my life. Have I come into a place of complacency? Are we to rise up from a distraction that's hindered us in fully doing what God's placed before us to do? And I, 
I believe that whether we're, we're having to rise up from something or rise up to something depends on, on how we answer the question. And I believe we're all called to rise up. We've talked about this a lot. We're all called to rise up to a new level of receiving revelation. We're to be pressing into the Word, pressing into our time with the Lord. Because especially in the day that we're living in, and you know, you can take this for whatever, we, 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 uh, we're declaring we're in the last of the last days. Well, Paul said that 2,000 years ago. Okay, and if it was the last days then, we're certainly in the last days now. But you can see the things that are happening that would point us to that. Yeah. The thing is, we need to be in a position of understanding who we are in Christ, understanding our, our, our place in the calling that He's put upon our lives, that we're carrying out the responsibilities He's given us. Because increased revelation brings increased responsibility. The more we know about what God is telling us in His Word, as, because God is continually revealing Himself. The God that never changes is keep, keeps showing us more of what He wants us to know about Him. He hasn't changed. We just haven't learned everything yet. All right? So we, He's constantly giving us increased revelation from His Word. He wants us to know Him more and more and more. The more we're a friend with someone, the longer we're married to someone, the more we get to know them. You know, we... It don't matter how long you've dated somebody, you don't know everything about them on your, on your wedding day. Okay? It takes years to get to know somebody in that, that, that place of an intimacy where, where you know what the other's thinking or doing or, and how to move and with that look. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Right? Are we so... Have we come to the place where we've received the revelation from God to know He's looking? Yeah. That certain look. Right. I feel it. Yeah. You know, or I just heard Him go. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We have to have that revelation that's, that, that's, that is so personal. And he, the more revelation He brings to us. How do we get it? In His Word. As we're spending time in prayer and in His Word and together in, in the Word. We're constantly receiving more revelation, but all the revelation we get brings us to a higher level of responsibility. What are we going to do with it? Yes. What are we going to do with the revelation? Amen. We've got to live it. Yes. Okay? He doesn't give it to us so we can say, oh, that's nice. He gives it to us so we can live by it. Okay? Because it leads us into a greater amount of victory over the things of the world, over the things of the flesh, a greater understanding of how to operate in the, in the flow of the Spirit, how to move in, in all that He's called us to do. And it, it's just how to how, even even uh, hearing better what the Spirit of God is saying to us. It's all revelation that comes to us. We have a greater responsibility to move in it. But then that also takes us to a higher level of accountability. Yeah. Now we're accountable to God for what are we doing with it? Yeah. How are we living? Accountability to our whole life in the Spirit. That it's fun. <laughs> it's the most exciting time I've ever lived in. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's just uh, the more God reveals, the more God shows us, the more God calls us to, the more exciting it gets. Yeah. And uh, it's just going to keep on expanding into that. But Amen. I just have to come back to what question is Jesus asking us yeah. right now? Yeah. Do you love me? How are we answering? Do you love me? Do you love me more than these? How will you answer? How will you answer? Praise God. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for your word. Your challenge to us today. Lord, as you reach into the very depths of our being with the question, do you love me? Lord, everyone in this room says, yes, Lord, we love you. But then we have to examine our hearts and say, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that answer? 
So help us, Lord, as we move forward from here, meditating on your word, reaching in for the revelation that you have for us, spending time with you in that place of intimate communion. Lord, help us to have a greater understanding of our answer. Yes, Lord, I love you. What does that mean to us? Thank you, Lord. Thank you again for the challenge. But thank you, Lord, that you are encouraging us. You're lifting us up. You're causing us to rise up into that place that you have called us to and have desired for us, that destiny that we were talking about this morning in prayer, leading us into the destiny that you have designed for us. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. We worship you. We glorify you. We come in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you for joining us out there today, and, and I just pray that this, this message just continues to minister to you as you meditate on that challenge that, that God has brought to us from His Word today. I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to us very, very, very clearly today with that question that we might think, that's a strange question. Do you love me? But do we? How do we love Jesus? What is the depth of our love? What's the meaning of the word love? Do we love Jesus? What's your answer? Meditate on that, and I call you blessed in Jesus' name.